multi-award winning wedding photographer extraordinaire. Mr. Kuzli has over 10 years professional experience as a wedding photographer, and in that period, he received several awards, most recent being winner of the 2018 Caribbean Wedding Industry Awards for Photography. His outstanding work can be seen in publications such as Munamichi Bridal, 2016 to 2018 issues, Be Inspired Magazine, and I Do Magazine. Mr. Kuzi is a wedding wire five-star rated wedding photographer. This qualifies him to share with us this evening on the topic, wedding photography beyond the gear. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the wonderful world of wedding photography through the eyes of master photographer, Mr. Mary Kuzi. Thank you, Sherry Ann. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks to the Jamaica Photographer Society um, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to be here. This is my first presentation um, of this nature. We're presenting to all photographers, um, especially experienced photographers. Looking around the room, I recognize numerous faces. So thanks for having me. Um, I hope that what I present will help some of you. Um, how I started? I started, um, as Sharon said, over 10 years ago. My wife bought me a Rebel XT. Uh, I don't know what you saw in me, but I started doing landscape photography, hobbies like most photographers do. And I got bored of landscape photography. Don't stone me. I got bored, <laughs> I got bored of landscape, just landscape alone. Um, so I started shooting people. And then I realized combining the, both people and landscape kind of let me feel this satisfaction. Um, a friend asked me to do their wedding. I did his wedding for free. Another friend saw his pictures. I did their wedding for free. And then a light bulb went off when somebody else asked me. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I should be charging. <laughs> so that's how it started. Um, it took a turn for the better when I started doing destination weddings where people coming from overseas to do hotel weddings. And that kind of spoonball I did, I started taking vacation from work, had a regular nine to five job doing IT, um, making good money from it um, for our bank. And I ran out of sick days, I ran out of vacation leave doing weddings. <laughs> and it kind of pushed me out of the nine to five to do wedding photography. Um, so I could at that time project how much, because of destination wedding in particular, they have to book their flights and hotels a year in advance. So I could tell a year beforehand how much money I would be making. Um, so I could comfortably step out without wife killing me to do the full-time photography. Because when I tell people I'm going to do the photography, they're, oh, photography, are you serious? You can live from that? Yeah, but that's how it started, and it's been good for 10 years. Um, the challenge is staying ahead of the, the game or up there with a the pack. So that's about me. Um, just some disclaimers. Um, in my view, photography is really personal. Each of us see the world differently. So what looks good to me may not look good to you. So you have different type of photography. Um, some people might like natural light. Here people complaining about flash photography versus natural light photography. And I'm saying maybe you should learn to do both. You might have a preference for natural light as this image here, or you may default to strobe and do more like a harsh look with a darker background. It's really a personal taste. And I would advise you to shoot for yourself first, and you'll attract that type of client to yourself. Don't try and shoot for everybody. So that's a disclaimer. So what I'm presenting to you is how I do it. I can, be st I can stand corrected on any issues. Um, and I'll explain to you why I shoot the way I shoot. Um, I'm not, I, I name it beyond the gear, because we tend to get caught up in the gear and settings and what your camera setting should be. How I think this would be of value to you if, is if you understand why I shot the shot the way I shot it, how I came to the aperture, shutter speed, rather than taking it from the setting side and then talking about the image. So I wanted to give you, for each image, what was going through my mind when I was doing it and how I arrived at the setting. Because I might tell you one setting for a particular image and you go and try and do it, and it would be totally different because the sun was at a different angle or something different. So 
Don't get caught up on the gear. I've never met somebody who can look on the image and say, oh, that's Canon. They always ask what camera is. It don't matter. <laughs> yeah, it's Canon. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, I started out with a Rebel XT. My wife bought it, so I was stuck with it, and I'm happy with it. <laughs> happy with the Canon. So, but that, that's not really important. Um, so, now that we got that out of the way, I want to move beyond the gear, but uh, most photographers want to know what the gear is. So, I'm just going to get the gear out of the way. And the next side, uh, this is my camera bag. Um, and I'll just go through each lens and what I use it for. And this is just over years of trial and error and seeing what I like. And then I end up with this, trying to be compact and efficient um, with how I travel and how to get the job done quickly. Um, so I'm going to start from here and work, work my way around the lens. This is a pouch um, that I keep batteries, spare batteries, filters, any knickknacks I want to use. This is a Canon 1.285. Um, the 85. I use that in emergencies when it gets dark, when you're running late, and I want all the light I can get, then that's when I shoot at 1.2. It's hard to focus with the 85. That's what, the, the, the picture is phenomenal, but it's hard to focus. If I shoot five images, um, three will be in focus and two will be out of focus because of that thin margin of depth of field. So I use it in emergencies, I use it for um, reception photos, people making speech, and so on. This is the Canon 100 IS Macro. I use that to the ring shots. You're going to see some images from these. I use it to the ring shots. Um, there's a cheaper version of it, which is just a Canon 100, um, which is phenomenal. But I had to go with the IS, not because it's top of the line, but because of the image stabilization. And at my age, I'm <laughs> shaking a little bit. So I need the IS. And because it's wedding, it's not um, macro where I can set a tripod and take my time. And I have to be doing fast, doing it fast. So this is my tripod. Um, camera is here, lens is on my finger, and this finger is on the table. And hold my breath and take the, take the picture. So I needed the eyes for that. The, this is a LED that I use for like detail shots, rings, cake, anything I want to pinpoint light on, which my flash can't do because it can just blow the entire place. So I walk with a LED. Um, this is a Canon 16 to 35, wide angle dramatic shots. I love those. This is where I incorporate landscape with people. So you're going to take a few shots with this. I work this in the evening mostly. Canon 5D Mark III, full frame, two full frame cameras. This is the Mark IV. If you're shooting Canon, I need to buy a Canon and get the Mark IV. It's a big upgrade in the, in the autofocus. Um, I was about to sell the 85 because it's slow to focus. But since I got this, it kind of improved the focus on the 1.2. So Canon Mark IV, awesome. 50, Sigma 50 millimeter, 1.4. That lens is probably my second favorite. Um, this is what is on the camera most of the time. All right, a lot of photographers will shoot the 35 millimeter. Um, but I find that the 50 for me kind of give you a little bit more compression. And if I'm shooting people with it, like up close, if the bride is here, it's close to me, then I don't have to back up as I would with the 35. Because the 35 at up close would probably make the nose bigger. Um, so I find the, 80, the 50 is a little more versatile. The only challenge I have with the 50 versus 35 is in some of the rooms where the brides are getting ready, um, I probably have to back up to the wall um, in order to get them. The Canon, the Canon 1.250, with the 85, it's similar to the 85 1.2. Um, it has what we call fringing. If you're in a certain lighting situation, you see a purple, like a purple outline on the person. So I, where you see it, and you have to correct that in Lightroom. So I, I read the reviews on the 50, the Sigma, and um, it's bigger than the Canon but you don't have that fringing issue, even at 1.4. I hear they have like auto focusing with, this, with this, the 85. As I said before, three would be in focus, two would be out of focus. With the Sigma, you have to try to be out of focus. Like, it's just spot on every time you shoot. So the Sigma to me is, is sharper, quicker to focus than the 50 Canon. And tried both of them. 
This is my favorite lens, um, 70 to 200. Um, most of my portraiture is done with 70 to 200. If you're doing weddings, um, this is a must have lens. Not just for portraiture, but even during ceremonies, you can get somebody in the back there from up here without going to them and without them knowing. So a lot of your candid shots is going to be done with a long lens. So rather than coming up and then notice you, same thing with the street photography, you can use the lens there and without people knowing. Um, and the compression that it gives you, one of the biggest benefits with the 70 to 200, a lot of times you're in situations where you have junk on the right, junk on the left, and the subject is in the middle. This will just isolate them and you don't know where the person is. So that's my favorite lens here. I have three flashes. Oh, before I go to the flash, there's a, there is a Sigma 15 fisheye underneath this flash. I started using it about two years ago. Indians love the fisheye effect. When I was doing that Indian wedding, they requested a fisheye look. So I got the Sigma for that. I rarely use it because of the distortion. Um, but there's an image in here that I'm going to show you that I used it at a recent Indian wedding as well. It, it, it's artistic, and it just adds some variety to it. Canon three flashes, Canon 600. Um, I don't walk around with strobes for weddings because of the weight. I'm kind of lazy. The, the flash is just quick and easy. Um, I'm going to show you. I don't use softbox during weddings. <laughs> yeah. I don't use softbox during weddings. It, it's, it's too cumbersome. A lot of the weddings I'm doing is on the beach. And I don't want to see it blowing, blowing down the beach. So I learned how to just dial back the flash power um, for those shots. And to be honest with you, when I use the softbox, if it's not right here, I'm not noticing the difference between when I use it, the, the direct flash and the softbox. If I angle it correctly, you'll probably see a sharp shadow here, but only photographers will notice that. <laughs> Most of the clients don't notice it. So I'm using those flashes, and I don't, need, I don't need a trigger. I can have one flash on the camera. And I can people learn some things. I can have one flash on the camera and radio trigger both other flashes without, without line of sight. No, you use infrared. You have to have line of sight. With, with these cannon, you can shoot through the wall without <laughs> line of sight. <laughs> that was recent. Um, well, a couple of years now. And Gorilla Pod. As I said before, I'm kind of lazy. I only have one, I only walk with one light stand and that Gorilla Pod. That Gorilla Pod is my backlight. I put one of the flashes on it and you'll see it in, one of the, in a few of the la landscape shots. Photographers will notice the difference with the, the rim light behind the person. A lay person will say, whoa, that looked good, but they can't really pinpoint what it is that looked good. And I'm going to show you what I did with the, the, the backlight. And that, that is perfect for beach shots. I, I couldn't set a tripod or a light stand on rocks, where this can just wrap around trees, it can go on the rocks, and quick, quick, you have a backlight. Just tilt it upwards towards the person, and you see a rim light right there. It's nice. Um, Eclipse chewing gum, you need that if you're doing weddings. <laughs> yeah, you have to have chewing gum. Later on in the night when the breath starts to kick and you're talking to your clients, yeah, freshen up. Or if you want to walk with a toothbrush. And I have multiple cards in there. We should never run out of cards. I was at, at a wedding once and I saw a photographer counting the shots as the bridal party coming down the aisle. Click. Usually, somebody's click, click, click to make sure the expression is right and everything. So I'm saying, oh, oh, this guy's, so I was thinking, this guy's old school, he was film day, so I'm counting, click, click. By the end of the ceremony, he ran out of cards. And it was a friend's wedding, so he, he asked me to step in for the reception. And he was there at the reception, deleting, deleting. Uh, cards are cheap, just, just spend the money, and, and you don't need a name brand card. With the Canon, um, you have two card slots. I don't shoot rolling over from one card to the next. I shoot to both cards at the same time. Um, so if one gets corrupted, and it happened to me before, I have a copy on the, on the other one. You can't shoot a wedding <laughs> again. You don't have a second chance. So don't be lazy. Use the two cards as simultaneous shooting. Like, 
One copy to the next card. It power? No, it doesn't. Mm -mm. You just run out of card. You run out of card speeds earlier. No, no more battery <coughs> power to do that. So if you, and I'm not sure if Nikon have dual card slots. I think yeah. I think they do. Yeah, yeah. If you're shooting commercial work um, and you're tethering to the laptop, then you can shoot to one card. That's fine on flow. But if you're doing a wedding, I suggest you shoot to two cards at the same time. Um, just to keep a backup, because I, I did have it, have one card corrupt, mm -hmm. and I used the other card, and thank God that the images was there, were there. So yeah, that's the gear, and we're moving beyond the gear. All right, wedding photographers roll on the wedding day. Um, this is my daughter. This is the. <laughs> this is my backup shooter. This was a. This is our photo walk, actually, of Port Royal, Fort, Fort Rocky, one of those. Yeah, this is the Rebel that I started out with. XT? Yeah, XT, Rebel XT. So this is not what to wear at a wedding, that's the first thing. <laughs> and this is how you're supposed to pose. Um, the role of a wedding photographer, document the day. The bottom line, this is why people hire us, to make sure we get everything, detail, rings. How many persons here shot a wedding before? Oh, a lot. All right, cool, 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 sweet. Yeah, our role is to document the day. And we have multiple landscape people and portraiture people, um, any sport photographers, macro photographers, good. Um, so wedding photography is encompass everything. You have to know macro, you have to know sport, you have to know landscape, have, it's a combination of everything. I have to be proficient and quick because your worst enemy on a wedding day is time. Well, maybe rain, but you can work around the rain. You can work with the rain. You can grab umbrellas and go outside and get some phenomenal romantic shots of the rain. Um, but time, time, I mean, it just run by as quickly. So you have to be very efficient and quick. You don't want to be the one that the planner is waiting on for the ceremony. Uh, problem solver. Um, whenever a client come to us, we don't want to say we can't do it. We have to figure out a way to do it. I remember one client wanted um, a picture by a waterfall. And when we got there in the evening, the wedding ran late. It was in darkness. So all right, simple. Use the same gorilla pod. Put a flash on the waterfall. Use the other flash on the couple. And it, it solved a problem, and they were happy. Yeah, so you have, we have to think quickly on the feed. Never, never let them see a sweat. <laughs> Don't let them see a sweat. Make sure you have two cameras. Don't shoot a wedding with one camera. I've had cameras shut down. Never shoot a wedding without two cameras. Yeah. So if you're there and it's not coming on, you don't go in a panic. You just go for the other one and start, continue. Um, maintain your professionalism. Stay cool. Um, be courteous. Dress well. And don't drink. <laughs> Almost at every wedding, somebody going to ask you if you want a drink. Say, yes, lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the night before the wedding, so we're going into the wedding day. Um, and feel free to ask questions as we go. Charging up your batteries, um, make, making sure your gear is clean, is working, and review a timeline for the next day. Um, you should know at least what time the ceremony starts, at minimum. How many persons here know what a first look is? First look wedding. No, no, sorry. Uh, for the wedding, on the wedding day itself. All right, I'm going, going to it a little bit. Um, it's, it's growing more popular now because they're spending more money. So they need more bang for their buck. So yeah, review your timelines, know at least what time to get there, and plan your route, plan the time you're going to leave out, add 30 minutes to the time you think you want to leave so you're not running late. All right, in the morning now, I'm just running through this boring stuff, but it's necessary for the wedding. Um, so you want to plan ahead because you're, you're gonna have car issues one day. If you're shooting a lot of weddings, you're bound to get puncture, um, traffic delays, especially if you're going out of town. Um, hotel security delays, if you're shooting a wedding at the hotels, most of the time they have the name there on the table and they can't find the name. I see a lady run through the list one time. So there's no way she could be reading that. Turned out that she couldn't read. And she didn't want to let us in. So we were there for 30 minutes waiting to go into the hotel. So plan ahead of time for those kind of delays. 
Because nobody don't want to hear, oh, this did happen or that did happen. Uh, or you can't find the venue. All right, getting ready for the bride. This is where all the nerves are gone. I'm most nervous when I'm traveling to the venue. When I get there, <laughs> then all the nerves go away. It's, it's getting there is my biggest fear. Because I know that they're, they're depending on the pictures. Um, so we try to shoot the dress, shoot everything the couple paid for, you try and get it. You don't want, after the wedding, they're asking, oh, you didn't get this or you didn't get that. Try and get everything. Once you pay for it, you shoot it. Um, and shoot it well, creatively, they're like, so you have a good body of work in your portfolio. Shoot the makeup on the hair, get a wide angle shot of the, the room with the, the bridal party and the girls getting dressed. 50 millimeter for the most part, very rarely I find a small room and I have to back up on the wall, but most of the time it's a 50. So I don't get a lot of distortion. Uh, 85, yes, for close-up, like, like an eyelash shot. If Sometimes I use a macro, or sometimes I use an 85, because the 85 kind of give a softer background. So I might do a veil shot with the eyes or something like that with the 85. But with the 85, I have to hold my right and shoot because it's so thin, um, the 1.2. So sometimes I'm at F2, thereabout. Um, yeah, fun shots, fun shots with the girls. Next one. All right, so this is a typical dress shot. I used to just shoot it straight on and blah, but then I wanted it to kind of feel like I'm just entering the room. So I had to step out the room, get the door on the right here, and kind of get the eyes going into the room um, using natural light. So it was kind of dark on the dress itself. All I did, there was no flash involved. There was a door to the left over there. I opened that door and then light came in and I got that shot. Um, shoes, details, nothing fancy there, just keep it clean. Um, so this is a high key shot, nothing fancy, natural light, light coming in from here. So I'm a natural light photographer. I like, for weddings, I like natural light. But I use flash to solve problems. So I don't default to flash. I default to natural light and I learn to solve problems with the flash. Dress shots, wide angle, 16 to 35. Um, you want to get, all right, the point of this shot, uh, where I bring it up here is, a lot of times things run behind at the wedding, and you want to get as much detail in the room before you head out, because you might forget later to do the back of the dress, and the bride loved the back of this dress. So this was like two minutes before we run out to the ceremony. Let's do it right now, because I don't know if I'm going to have time later and you grab the shot. So whatever you can shoot early in the day, you get it out of the way, get it off your list, because you don't know if you're going to have time later. She arranged that, or you arranged the tray? Uh, I arranged it, just, yeah, oh. just one fluff. And clean, clean the room. I like when the room is clean and tidy. All right. So I got bored of ring shots, got bored of just putting it down on the table and shooting directly. Um, I don't know if anybody can guess what this green thing is. Christmas light? No, it was the middle of June. <laughs> yeah, is her, is her shoes? Boat shoes, um, one behind, one in front. So I wanted, um, I wanted like a foreground, subject, background. Kind of give some depth to lead the eye into it. That LED that I told you about, all we do is, is hold it above. I learned this trick from my friend here, Clive, on video from DVC. Um, I saw them using the LED one time, the, the focus on the, 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 the ring, and run the LED across it. I said, oh crap, I can't do that in pictures. <laughs> so but we started doing the LED and adding some elements to it. And this can be done anywhere. So if you're in a cluttered room, there's nothing inspirational. You, you just get the LED, get your background foreground, and create something. It's, it's very easy once you put the elements. So, we didn't have any background before. Um, it was just bland and plain. And that's, those sparkles you see there is a bride clip, the hair clip in her thing. So this ring reminds me of um, Lord of the Rings, yes. um, the precious. <laughs> and incidentally, the, the invitation, the, the font on the invitation is also similar to the writing on the ring in the Lord of the Rings. So I kind of set it right there. This wedding we did last week, so I don't edit this yet. This is me here. <laughs> This is a videographer here. Yes. This is my assistant, and this is the LED, that same LED light. 
over here. So I'm going to have to go in post and take out all of that. And then I'll just grab one. This is probably not the sharpest one. Um, I, think I'm at F, I think I'm at F4 here. And I did some with F, at F5.6 to get some more of the diamond here in focus and sharp. Um, so we did quite a few. When, you do, when I do in macro, I do like 20 shots. Because I'm, I'm not on a tripod. I'm shaking. And I just try and get enough and pick the best one. Yeah, get the details. Usually we like folk, um, shooting the details on the bride. But if it's a nice box, then we'll just do it like a, like a product shot. Most brides want, want a fun shot with the girls before they head out to the ceremony. This shot was with the 50. Um, the bride want, brought all these things and wanted it, wanted this shot. Um, it's one flash right above my head, bouncing off the roof here to get, get everybody. Um, so when I use flash, I don't want you to know that it's flash. I don't want it to be evident. So I just use enough to get, get um, illumination on the faces. Did you have to do that several times to get that one? Uh, we did it twice. We did it twice. Okay. Yeah. Um, groom getting ready. So when we're done the details with the bride, um, if I'm shooting alone, the groom is really easy. The groom takes five minutes. The bride takes five hours. Yeah. So while the bride is finishing up her makeup, I run across to the groom to get some, some getting ready shots. And we're not doing shots from makeup go straight through. He's just putting on a jacket, putting on his detailed stuff. Um, this shot is one of those things when you shoot and shoot and shoot and you get bored of the same static. Um, all right, so I try to observe the rule of thirds when, I, when I'm shooting. Um, and sometimes I break it. So this shot is observing the rule of thirds. He's over here in this, in this section. This is here. His head is there, and so on. Um, another rule is allowing some leading space in front of the person. I couldn't do it in this case because there's a messy bed right here. All right? Um, so I was shooting here. This was boring, but this was a cabinet that could open. And I thought maybe, all right, this leading line here to him, all right, I'm going to just open the cabinet and add something, some kind of more depth to it. So as you shoot, you'll see things just follow your mind. If your instinct tells you, oh, this is boring, then try something different. Um, so you get the groom suit, shoes, watch, best man helping groom, the usual thing. Anything that's happening, being in the right place at the right time at a wedding is critical. You need to be thinking about that. What am I missing now? While I'm here with the groom, what, what is the bride doing? Right, she was doing her makeup, she was doing her hair, she should be done in 10 minutes. So you have to be thinking about where you need to be if you don't have an assistant. Um, so you have to constantly be thinking, all right, what time is it now? Ceremony, ceremony is approaching. Um, let's go do that. Detail shot of the groom suit. Usually we like doing it with the suit on. When it's unique, um, we'll kind of put it by itself to put in the album beside the bride's dress. Detail shots of the groom stuff. This is natural light with a window coming this way. Um, sometimes we'll put a pillow down here to kind of bounce back a little more fill light. But I think it, it was kind of hard and look manly to have the hard shadows. Um, and we like doing the watch on the groom suit. The grooms love this shot. Sometimes I'm a bit low and get the groom like up up half of his, um, his face blurry. Yeah, shooting down and up to get some of his face. Sometimes we do that and mix it up. But I like seeing the cuff lane and the watch together like they're just putting it on. Um, 51.4. Um, get the guys getting ready. Um, don't forget, sometimes we get locked into the bride and the groom, but don't forget the, everybody else um, at the wedding. This one I wanted, a lot of chance happening in wedding photography, or photography in general. Um, but you can set yourself up to work your way into that chance happening. So I always want to have the viewer kind of working their eyes through the image. And I was kind of by the window here waiting on something to happen. And then he just turned around and did this. And I wanted the foreground guy here leading to the subject and going around to the guys in the back. Um, some of these chances come your way when you kind of anticipate and set yourself up for it. So I don't mind shooting by myself. What I miss shooting by myself is when we're doing pictures portraits after the ceremony and cocktail is going on, um, bigger weddings, um, obviously more reactions from people. 
But even so, when, when the second shooter is there, we kind of try and double up. So even though he's doing the grooms, I still go in there because I have a ton load of time. Women take eight hours. <laughs> so we still kind of double up with that. <laughs> 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 so yeah, um, these guys wanted to pray, pray for Scott here, um, saying that he was committing suicide. That was, that was, a, that was, <laughs> that was the idea. <laughs> They came up with it. <laughs> so there's a light at the filler, a door at the filler here, a door behind them. This door illuminating his face, his face, and that door, this guy, uh, no flash. 51.4 um, all the way back in the room. The middle one. Yeah, the 35 could have done it. But when I'm using the 16 to 35 to shoot, I find myself still cropping in to get out to get out crap. So that's why I default to the um, 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Detailed shots, groom gifts, and bride gifts. Sometimes you go to weddings and they have it in a suitcase and you forget. One of your standard questions should be, is there anything hidden? Like a note, um, because they're going to come to you in the evening and say, oh, I forgot to give you this. So the more you do it, a lot of couples give their bridal party gifts. And sometimes they don't remember to take it out. So that could be one of your problem solvers where during the getting ready, you say, oh, do you have a note for the bride? If not, that's fine. Do you have a gift and so on? And you get, you get those detail shots. Groom leaving for the first look. Or every groom loved this shot, walking, buttoning his tucks and looking sharp and manly. All right, so we're going to the big ticket item now, guys. Um, Tradition is get ready, go to the ceremony, um, and do your pictures after. You run go to Hope Gardens for one hour, your guests cuss and go on bag when they're hungry, waiting on you at the reception. All right? First look is what we do before the ceremony now. Where, so the first look now is what we do before the ceremony. This is one hour of pictures that the bride and groom takes advantage of at a venue. The, bride will, the groom will stand and wait on the bride, tap, and they see each other for the first time. And then we do one hour of pictures with just the bride and the groom. After the ceremony, we have family pictures to take, we have bridal party pictures to take, and then we have couple pictures to take. That is one hour of cocktail. Unless some couples will book two hours between, between the ceremony and the reception. But that's a long time for the guests to be waiting. So we usually have to cram everything in one hour. And I've never done a wedding where we get enough pictures of the bride and groom in that one hour because we have family pictures. Family take like 15, 20 minutes. Bridal party, another 15, 20 minutes. And that leaves us with 25 minutes, 30 minutes for the, for the couple. So the first look gives them the opportunity to Walk around the property, take your time, not rushing to get to the reception. Um, a lot of couples ask for it, and a lot of couples still against it. I've sat with couples recently, spent a whole hour explaining this to them. <clears throat> and it, it, on the day of the wedding, they decided, two days before, they decided not to do the first look. Um, it was in the country, and the hairstylist was two hours late. So the ceremony started almost, it went almost into darkness. So it only had a, a draw for the 85 1.2. It was dark at 6.30 minutes to 7. S slow shot of speed, holding my breath, and get some daylight shots. But look what looked like daylight shots. Um, but they only got a few images. And it's quite a bit of time I have to do that where I try to convince them, all right, the groom is turning around, coming down the aisle, 15 seconds. Oh, or you want one hour of pictures before the ceremony. Um, I mean, that, that should have been the tradition. So the advantage is there. It, it gives you enough time to get the daylight shots. Um, it allows for a relaxed session, because once we're rushing for that cocktail hour, um, OK, come right here, pose. It, it's, you don't get natural pictures that way. Um, one hour of pictures, take advantage of venue, and act as a buffer. There are times when things run late again, but say the, the, the ceremony starting at 4. Uh, we had a first look session scheduled for 2.30 to 3.30. Things run late, but it's usually within that one hour. So we didn't get to do the first look, but we're still on time um, for the ceremony. 
So that's another advantage for it. Rain, rain may come after the a wedding at Trident in, in um, Portland recently, well, last year. Um, the couple decided on the day to do the first look. And before they did the first case at the ceremony, we did the first look, get a ton load of images around Trident. And before the ceremony was done, rain came pouring down. Wow. It didn't stop until reception time. So if we didn't do it, they would have lose out. So the first look myth now that guys don't cry. Guys cry at the first look. So that same emotional attachment is there at the first look. It's just that your guests, the guests not there with them. Um, and a lot of times, most guys who cry at the first look still come to the ceremony and cry. <laughs> so, so it's a big advantage um, to do the first look. All right, this is, this is an alternative to the first look. This is the first touch. So if the, this couple did the first look, but they want to do the first touch as well. So some people are adamant. If you have a small, small wedding and you don't have reception to go to, then you will want to do the pictures after the sermon, and that's fine. Once you have the time, once you can meet the time. So they'll do a first touch before um, the ceremony. We sometimes do it at hotels, we do it at the elevator, and a lot of couples request this as well. All right, this picture, I want to show another advantage of the first look. So this is a villa. The beach, there's a cliffside here with a ceremony, um, Bourgainville and Discovery Bay. Cliffside, ceremony site is here. Over there is the actual villa. Um, if we didn't do a first look, when all their guests arrive from the hotel, this entire place would, would have been unavailable and we would not get the shot. Um, we'd have to find somewhere else and squeeze them up in somewhere and I wouldn't. This is breaking the rule of thirds. They are smack dead center, but I wanted them inside of, of, of these trees here. Um, so I kind of look for that in the background. When I'm posing the couples, I look what the background is doing. Same thing with trees, with clouds. If the clouds is moving this way, then I may put them down here where the clouds come into them kind of thing. Don't ignore your background. So, and that's one of the reasons I don't shoot with the 1.2 so much, because it kind of blow the background. You spend a lot of money to come to Negril, and then you obliterate the background with 1.2. Um, so I like combining nature um, with, with people. Scouting saves you a lot of time, and you optimize the location. So you'll find the best spot if you scout. And then even if you know the location, you look for different angles um, to give a different picture. So I wouldn't shoot another couple with this tree thing. I'd find a different, and it's just subtle changes. Just slight movement will change the entire composition. This picture I wanted to show you, not because they're smiling pretty. Um, when, you're comp when you're posing couples, probably should do that in regular portraiture as well. But for detail, um, having her on this side, facing me this way, having him here. If I had switched him around, then the boots in here would have been on the other side and disappear. Or hair piece would have been on the other side. So you have to think about even the detail when you're posing. When you're posing, I mean the, the hair, the part in the hair kind of annoy me a little bit, but I rather get the detail. Um, <laughs> I rather get the detail. And I did fill it in some with the, with the, um, with Photoshop. Just a little bit of hair. It was kind of more bald. So you have to do these things when you're presenting it, the final images to the to the couples. I find for my Caucasian friends, I don't need to use flash. Um, for darker skin tone, I use a little, little bit of flash, no soft box. So where I'd use a soft box here, I had a flash on them, and you could never tell, right? Where I'd use a soft box here, I would be probably at, say, 132 as a setting. With a direct flash, I'm all the way down to 128. So very just enough to just, just slightly touch their skin to, to give a pop. Um, but lighting, I find the location and I look at where the sun is and, and so on. And I plan that ahead. Another advantage of doing a first look are scouting your venue. Um, the dress was boring coming down to the veil, right? That. This is at the Hyatt in Montego Bay. And then I just had my assistant stand up behind me, hold it up, slight toss, and we got that shot. 16 to 35, and there are two big windows behind me, natural light. 
dead center again. If I'm not shooting ruler thirds, I'm shooting symmetry, where I have um, something leading lines. Maybe 128 or 200, because there's a lot of light coming in from behind me. You have to pre-plan that no matter what the mood is of the couple, you're going to fight above that and try and get the shot. Because it happened to me a lot, where the vibe of the couple is like down. For whatever reason, things could probably not be going well at the hotel or whatever. However, and you have to kind of just consciously say, all right, it's not about you. Try and just rise above it and get them motivated. Because um, it does affect how long you spend shooting. Because you know you can shoot for 20 minutes. You get the pictures you want, and you just head to, head to ceremony. If a couple vibes you and like it, you'll want to spend more time. So you have to push now. Even when they're not vibes it, you just push ahead and go. And so it's like, that's why this entire presentation is beyond the, beyond the gear. And that's definitely not gear related. Um, yeah, first look, walking, standard shot, taking advantage of the architecture of the location. Um, this ceremony was 5 o'clock. We definitely had to do a first look. Once it's 4 or 5 o'clock, if it's December in Jamaica, 5.15 is dark. You have to plan that ahead as well and recommend it. If they're having a 3 o'clock wedding, anything after 3 o'clock, we're doing a first look. 4 o'clock in December. In the summer, it's different. Um, summer, they can have a 5 o'clock ceremony. They can have a four o'clock ceremony and you still can do pictures after. Um, but December, be gone. All right, ceremony, ceremony, let's run through quickly. Ceremony, detail, this is standard now. Between the ceremony and the reception, you can do the same thing for these. Get every detail, get the aisle, get the, the arch, try and get it before the, 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 the audience or the congregation gets there. Get a wide angle. Your planners going to want your detail shots. Um, decor people and so on. So if you have an assistant, you send him ahead to do it before everybody gets there. If you're shooting by yourself, you, you either ask the, the planners to just hold everybody back until they're ready to start, because they usually do, because they want the pictures. But if you're running really tight and can't make that everybody's tired and they need to sit, then you may lose that shot if you don't have an assistant. Um, so in that case, I use like the 70 to 200 and make sure you get like the aisle shot, the flowers on the right, the, the, you can get detailed stuff even with people there. Yeah, so you get those out the way. Um, yeah, officiant waiting, groom waiting, prep for key moments. Yeah, prep for key moments. This is simply anticipating what is going to happen at the ceremony. Um, so you can be in the right place at the right time. So first look, you, you, you set up yourself, you know that vows and you know the sequence of the wedding. You get to learn it over time. The more you do it, um, so you get to anticipate and, and know when certain shots is coming up. We capture the groom first, because he's most of the time more critical. And then the bride is usually smiling. The groom is the one who's going to give you the sobbing or the emotion. <laughs> so the bride is an easy remake, especially when working with videographers like Clive here. Um, a lot of times we need to do it twice. Even if we have assistant, we do it twice. A lot of times these things happen slowly and some things look similar. So like the bird feed, they usually ask the bride to feed the groom, then the groom to feed the bride. And in a picture, you can't really tell which one is which. So you get away with some things like that. Um, the bird feed is one. And during the ceremony, um, this happened multiple times, the first look, you line up your first kiss, line up yourself for the shot, waiting on the first kiss. You're not going for the standard down the aisle shot anymore. You want to use the crowd, the heads of the people, and then have the couple right there for the first kiss. Line it up, and then a big iPad just come right up in your face. <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> and you shoot fast. So, <laughs> so, you can't get away from some things like that. You just have to hope for the best. Yeah, you have, to, you have to hope for the best. So if I'm doing the over-the-head shot um, of the first case, anticipating if it's, um, uh, sometimes at meetings, we we'll ask a couple if they want to have an unplugged wedding where you don't have phones, they leave their phones at the, the back or the iPads. Phones will get around easily, but when those iPads go up, total block. So yeah, so we we'll stay down the aisle. Unplugged weddings are nice because people get involved. They're not on them phone taking picture and coming out in the aisle. How do you maneuver with the video um, Most, most, 
most videographers um, are professional and they stay off and shoot from behind and you work together. Even during, even during our portrait session, I'll be shooting. I don't just hog the session myself. I would say, Clive, you want to go and do your thing? And then I shoot from the side while he's in charge. So you still get your candidates while he's in charge. So you work, you work with videographers. Very rarely these days I see videographers standing right at the aisle and blocking. Uh, most of them are using DSLRs now and zooming in. So they're going to be in the wide shot sometimes. Um, but I mean, they get paid to be there too. Same thing for um, when you go to some churches and the pastors, they ask, can I go behind the altar to shoot? You don't just go up there. So when you ask that question, I learned, I saw it online somewhere once and I started doing it and, it, and I realized it works. When you talk to them that way before the ceremony, um, they actually stop, like they stop the couple, tell them to turn and when they're putting on the ring and they can't wait for the photographer. So they, they recognize that you're there now. Right and they are not and they work with it. So once you work with people, and it goes for all vendors, um, once you work with people, you're not the only one there. Um, they'll work with you. And we have some awesome vendors here in, in, in Jamaica. Aerial shots, aerial pictures, big thing now. Um, Sligoville, not going to name the place, <laughs> but awesome place, awesome venue. I couldn't get this. I wish it was a less cloudy day, but um, that's the shot we got there. We did one from Lua as well. Beach wedding, you get, again, you get the wide. Um, natural light here. Well, I'm probably at F11 here. Um, so again, the, the, the settings don't matter because going, if it was cloudy, it might be F, F8. So you are the only one. Oh, I forget to tell you this. How I, how I approach settings on a camera. I, I decide first if I want a blurry background or everything in detail. So I start with the aperture. Most of the time, I'm at 1.4. Then the next thing would be the shutter speed um, and then the ISO. So that's how my brain works. If this is sunny, then I'm at starting at F8 and see where it drop. ISO 100. Um, same thing for everything else. Indian weddings from 7 in the morning to 12 in the night. The ceremony is 12 o'clock in the day. The worst sun ever. <laughs> it's the worst thing to do, but you have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do what you have to do. You can't work around it. Um, so this, yeah, a lot of people love this fisheye effect to get everybody coming in, um, dancing. This is people going to the ceremony now, then party from morning till night. Like, this is going into the ceremony. Barat, they call it the Barat. They're marching towards the ceremony site. The groom is here on a horse. Um, can barely see him. We have some close-up of him, and they're partying. Again, that's just landscape wide. Um, this is the actual ceremony now. Um, working with videographers and photographers and knowing your limitations. Um, this particular minister don't, don't like when guys come close to the, I don't remember the name of the particular setup here, but we had to shoot from far. And using the 7200 again is valuable because we were able to get right close up here as if we were right there. So in situations like that, and we had to wear a head covering. I wasn't being a rebel. We had to wear a head covering for this wedding. Um, so shooting at vantage points, videographers doing the same thing. When they were coming out under the tree and the background was blown out, field flash. The sun in that particular shot was behind the minister. So it was more like a backlight. So I exposed for his face for that shot. On the other side, when we were shooting, in with the sun coming in the people's face, then um, we dial it down. But where we used the fill flash was, the exit was that way behind those trees there. Under the trees, shady obviously, and the background, then I had a, f a flash on a stand beside me here at the back and pop with them coming out. Hindu weddings, in Indian weddings, uh, this is the solution, Google. <laughs> so before the day, Google. But, um, so like the minister now, this, it come back to the same thing, talking to him before the ceremony starts. So he was able to tell us where he wants us to be and where we shouldn't be. Um, so research. research, yeah. And when you shoot one, the thing, the thing with a wedding day, even though it's going by quickly, you have time to, if you make a mistake, you have time to fix it. Like that was going on for 30 minutes. So you could take your time and find your angles and 
if you mess up, you just do it again kind of thing. So each segment of the day, getting ready, ceremony, reception, you have multiple things happening and you have time to correct yourself. Um, formals and cocktail hour. So this is after the ceremony now, right? We'll, we'll move into the fun part <laughs> where you don't have to think too, yeah. Um, at one point in the ceremony. Yeah, when they're putting on the ring. We'll have the 70 to 200 most of the time. Um, so 70 to 200, just barely come down the aisle, zoom in to get the ring shot. But we don't need to be up there um, with a 70 to 200. You can just roam around the ceremony site. For churches where it's tight, um, the church in Ocho is where you have to be up front because there's no walkway on the right on the side so you have to go down in some in some places but we try it I, I don't like to be up front I don't like people seeing me so I try to stay um, if I'm shooting alone I'm covering the bride and there's I go through like two like a vow and a promise or I don't remember but I have time to shoot the bride over the groom's shoulder get her expressions then I walk over to the other side and get the groom um, if my assistant is there, he's doing the groom, I'm doing the bride, and then we still double up and, and get it. So you have time to get those shots. The key ones, you just need to remember the key ones that you might miss. The first case, um, I've had a couple cuss how I got a close up, but I didn't get a long shot. But the kiss was like, so there's no way I could have, there's no way. So, <laughs> so it was like a quick peck. So what? What I did, so what I normally do is zoom in with the 7200, get, get a half body kiss, zoom out, get the entire um, aisle with the, the arch and them kissing. And that's with the love of the copy that stays kissing, right? So you have time to zoom in, zoom out, bam, bam, bam. You can't do that with a prime limbs unless you can run back and run forward. So zoom in, zoom in, get, so we we'll always get the close up of the first kiss and a wide of the first kiss, um, except for those quick. <laughs> quick nips. For church, I have the two cameras, 7200 on one. I use something called a spider holster. Um, click that here, 7200 here, and the wide or the 50 clipped here. So if I need a wide, pull that off, shoot it, and then use the 7200. And the rest of the gear is in a think tank. The bag you saw is a think tank um, airport takeoff. It has a a built-in lock. So it has a, you pull it out from the side and it has a cable attached to it, wrap it around something and lock the, and lock the, and lock the arm. So most of the time for destination weddings, you're kind of all right, because the hotel is kind of under some kind of more security. But for in-town weddings, that's when you want to lock it up somewhere if you don't have somewhere safe to store it. Somebody else said? All right, three lenses, right? Two cameras. Three, three what? Three lenses, yeah. two Ceremony, ceremony. Yeah, you, you have the lens pouch. You have two bodies, so you have one lens, and then dedicate one to one camera. So that leaves you with two lenses. So then all you have to change is those two, right? So you just take some time. The, the, the ceremony is slow pace, you know. So when you get the close up, if you want a wide, click, click, walk around the back while the pastor saying him thing, and you go and get the wide, and yeah, it's slow. Um, I can't think of anywhere where you're going to need to change quickly and mm -hmm. things run away from you. So you'll have time to change. It's like a situation where you just decide, okay, for well, the first case, I'm using this and this. And yeah. This. Yeah. So if you have two cameras, let's say you have a, a, a fixed lens, right? <clears throat> you keep the wide angle here. For the first case, you shoot it. If you have that spider hole, sorry, you can put on the camera, take the wide, and get the wide. So it's, 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 that's why it's easier with a zoom lens. So you don't have to be changing in that situation. So you have to work out the logistics um, before you go and maneuver. But it's slow pace for the most part. Another thing is the lighting mm -hmm. like in the church. Mm -hmm. um, you get the zoom lens and the lighting for a candle too far. Mm -hmm. um, so do you use flashes at the, the altar? Um, 
bouncing off the roof. It's a really dark church, bouncing off the side of the, the church. Or the, if it's a high ceiling, then bouncing off the side. Um, that's when I draw for the 1.2. If you don't have a 1.2, then you probably should have a 1.4. You should have at least one fast lens other than a 2.8 for churches. Um, you have, most of the churches have enough light, but you have some churches dark, so you have to be bouncing. I find bouncing off wood, it doesn't affect skin tone that much. So even a church with a, with a velocity with wood, just high ISO bounce off it, and then you, you, color, you shoot raw, and you, you color, color color it, and you're good. You shoot Nikon or Canon? <laughs> 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 um, high ISO is 800 um, for church worst case was 1600 and it don't show and if it shows when you black and white it awesome yeah so it you, you just work with it most most of the cameras good question white balance for the entire day I shoot at 5200 Kelvin. I'm shooting raw, 5200 Kelvin. No, no, don't write it down. Because <laughs> it might not work for you. If you shoot raw, um, I don't, because of the fast pace of moving from one thing, remembering things to ask couple for if they shoot this or whatever. Um, I shoot at 5200 Kelvin. And for the, for the getting ready, if the lighting in there was 6400 Kelvin, correct one picture, all of them is 52, change it to 64, all of them is 64. So it's the same light. Um, outside, the light change, changes more, the cloud cover and everything. But for the most part, you're getting ready, pictures are constant. One, one, one setting. Um, reception is constant. So I just keep everything shoot raw and change. So I'm able to change rather than it skipping automatically from Kelvin to Kelvin. It's one thing and I just make one fix. It saves you in post. Auto white balance, headache. headache. Headache, yeah, because you're going to be in one room, getting ready room. Um, the bride has on a pink, um, what do you call that? The robe, robe, pink robe. For the Canon, you're going to see the pink in the, in the, in the skin tone. Then, cur then you turn no one, and then you turn to shoot the bridesmaids over here and the curtain green, and then the, it's a green tint. Yeah, so auto white balance, no. No, I don't shoot anything auto. It's, it's easier to fix in post when you shoot manual. If you mess up, if you mess up the, um, the exposure, shooting raw, if you mess up a bunch of images, you fix one, you just fix all of them. I use my assistant here, inshallah. <laughs> He's wearing a white shirt. Yeah. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a reflector. Yeah. We're, shooting, we're shooting the ring, just turn your back. <laughs> and use the shirt as reflector. But, um, I thought color clothes was for us to blend in. So most videographers, photographers wear black to kind of blend in, um, to, be, to be unseen. Hot? Yeah, that's why I wear white. <laughs> I can get away. So I use white and black. If, if, it's a, if I know it's like, a, I'm going to be inside all the time, I'm in a black shirt. But for the destination weddings, I wear a white, a white shirt. Um, black pants or khaki. Mm -mm. The white is really the women wearing the same as the bride, white dress. Yeah, because most men going to be wearing a white shirt and probably with a, yeah, so we get over with that. So the bridal party shots after the ceremony or before, um, you get the girls together, get the guys together. This is, this is again, natural light. The sun, this was early morning. This is that Indian wedding that started, we started shooting at seven. So this was about eight o'clock, eight, eight thirty. Light coming in from behind in the east there and I just expose for their, their skin tones and just have them walk, walk towards. 51.4 at 1.4. Guys, you get the girls together and you get the guys together. Most of the time I'm posing people, putting them in the scene I want and just have them do something uh, rather than stand up static. So this was posed and the next shot is we're walking to the ceremony and then I spin around and take the shot. Tell me which one you guys prefer. This is. This was a spin around and take. The pose. So you can do a mixture of both. So this idea of um, 
photojournalistic photographer and they're not going to pose you and get involved. I find it hard to believe. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but background is important to me. And what are the odds of me getting the background I want with a candid shot, with the exposure? So what I do is find a background, put them in there, and have them interact with each other and get something semi-candid. And then you, you do everybody together. Typical standing, walking, walking together shot, laughing. Um, <clears throat> I think people are moving away from the standard stand-up shot, pose, everybody. So we do both. Um, we do that first. Everybody stand up, bouquet here, um, dignified, get that out of the way, and then we do the fun shots. So same thing for the couple poses. Do your standard shot, because you don't want them coming to ask you for that shot that the grandma wants, where they're standing together just looking. Do the standard shot, it only takes a second, and then you do your fun stuff and creative stuff. This is 16, this is, this is a bonus shot that we normally do for our couples. Um, usually I'd have that, that um, Joby Gallerilla pod with a flash behind on the rock here, but because of the composition, um, I didn't do it for this shot. So I usually start off at F5, 6, ISO 200, shutter speed 200 at sunset. And then if it's brighter, then I just change accordingly. Um, I always look what the cloud doing and try and position them in such a way to get the cloud kind of working with the shot. Um, it's, it's not by most of the shots you'll probably see on my website. It's not by buck ups where the cloud lead into their heads or something. I just shift a little bit to get to look to take advantage of the the landscape. And then for this shot, I definitely waited. The waves were cracking here, so I definitely just time it and wait just to add one more element to the shot. The first picture I had up with the veil, with the, um, the veil, the yeah. end of the dress showing up, a bridesmaid suggested that. Yeah, so good. you ask, if somebody suggesting something valid, take it. <laughs> Can you get unique shots? But, but if somebody forcing pictures, say, okay, we're gonna do it. And very rarely I find people doing that. And well, every now and then I'll get the grandma asking for the flowers on the tree and I say, okay, yeah, we'll do it, grandma. It was 1975, but all right, <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it for you. <laughs> All right, so this is a trade secret, guys. Um, maybe somebody has came up with it, um, but it, it's not supposed to leave this room. Just use it for yourself. And those on Facebook. <laughs> All right, so I just, again, I told you that I'm lazy, right? That shot before, flash was off camera, um, and I use speed light. I don't use, most of the time we're shooting is in the evening. I don't need a strobe full power. I just need speed light. Speed light is just enough to be portable, quick and up, easy, windy, you're not toppling over with a soft box. So I learned how to just dial back a little bit just to get enough kiss. Um, and then one day I discovered I always wanted to do those bright shots, as I said before, and a silhouette. And then one day I'm shooting, 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 click, 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 and then the, sh the, the, the flash misfired. And then I got the silhouette and I said, oh crap. I don't have to turn off the flash now. I kind of click, 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 and make it misfire, and I get a silhouette shot in the same sequence of images. So I started employing it to get the exposure, get the light, click, 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 flash, misfire, and then we get a silhouette. So that's a, that's a little lazy trick. Yeah, that's a little lazy trick, yeah. Yeah, if you're using a strobe, if you're using a strobe, that won't happen. Yeah, strobe going keep firing. Mm. No, no, no. They'd usually help at the family portrait session, um, calling out the names and so. Most, the, the worst, the, the, the most, not the worst, but the most that a planner will do, um, that I've worked with, is just tell you that, all right, we need to go to the reception now. It's time to just cut this. Um, and then the couple will say, all right, we need a little more. But um, usually they don't get involved. Um, speak to the couple. Uh, don't deal directly. Um, any kind of issues you have with other vendors, um, let them deal directly with the couple. Because the couple hired you. You don't need to be in a confrontation um, with another vendor. Just let the couple decide. If the couple wants to take more pictures or want you to be in charge, you just say, look, um, I'm in charge here. Can you speak to her? If once, you, don't, you don't need to go in a battle um, with another vendor. And it happens, it happens with... Um, 
with some hotels where they don't even want to feed the photographer, you don't need to be begging them for food. Talk to the couple. The couple will go over there and set them straight, and then all of a sudden you see a plate of food come. <laughs> right? So yeah, don't get, don't get in battles with people. Um, just, you're a professional. Um, talk to the couple, say, look, we've been here since 7 o'clock this morning. We haven't eaten. Can we get some? You don't even have to show them up. They say, oh, you haven't eaten yet? All right. And Tom, go over and, and deal with it. And you're good. Problem solved. All right, reception. Reception is us. Kickback. Um, fun time. Getting the speeches, getting the expressions, getting the dancing. Do the detailed shots. Um, um, the planners will definitely thank you, especially they spend a lot of money on floors and everything. They'll thank you for the detailed shots. Thanks. All right, so this is a shot that is being requested more and more for magazines. Planners requesting this shot. Um, <clears throat> we'll kind of give you a hint of everything at the reception, all the details. So this, this was two weeks, a week or two weeks ago. Um, we wanted the cake before the couple came in. I decided where I wanted to position them, get the cake in there, get the head table, get a centerpiece, what the dance floor, this unique dance floor is here. And then when I went home and saw this chair on his foot, I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> chair don't look good. What happened was I was standing up, position them, pose him, push your hand on his shoulder, break up the straight line with the S curve, bring your leg this way. Um, Jay, sit up, good posture, pose. And I was standing up, and this draped line here was cutting her face right here when I was standing. So as I put the camera to my face, I saw the line coming across her face, and I just stooped down. Get the shot. And because I wear glasses, I never check the back of the screen. When I bend down, then this chair rose up, covering his foot there. I didn't see it until I got home, but I mean, it works. But those are good details annoy me. Um, so you want to get those right as much as you can. And composition. What would have been the solution in that situation? Take the chair out. I took, th this chair came, there was a chair here, and I took it out. But because I was standing, I could see his foot, I could see everything. Never noticed this line through her head until I put the camera to my face. And then didn't look down here when I stooped down. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things. Most of the time, you look for those things before you put the camera to your face and fix them. Um, one of the things I learned is, is um, to s look at the scene, look at your macro, look at your portrait before you bring the camera up. Look for all the little details, because once you bring the camera up, it's almost like them disappear, you don't see them. So fix the scene before you bring the camera up and do it. This was one flash. Did I use a softbox here? Can you tell that is, that is direct, direct beer bulb flash? It was one flash, beer, bl beer bulb over here to my right, down this way. Just, just enough. And the only shadow I could make out was this one right here on our arm. That only sharp shadow there. So I don't have the soft box, and I kind of pull it back and don't get the. The, rest of the light on his over here. Shoulder light is, is from the DJ. DJ light over here, and everything under here is from the dance floor. Fill light under here from the dance floor. You get away with bones in flash for reception when, they, when you have a white canvas like that at the top. For, for we're going to let go another trade secret. For, another, <laughs> for translucent tents, you can't bones. I don't like seeing photographers walking out in the broad daylight like bouncing off the, off the sky. Um, so yep. what we do is shoot, what I realize is if I tilt upward with, the, with that little white card thing, once I have an off-camera flash being triggered at the same time, it adds light behind here, and it kind of kill that direct flash look. Um, I don't know if anybody here tried it before, but you're almost your direct flash, but once you have an off-camera flash firing behind and light, lighting up the back, it kill that direct flash look, ugly look. 85, 1.2 get the centerpiece. They always ask for the centerpiece. Um, the first time a planner asked me for, that, for a charger that was missing off a table. I was looking for a car charger. But this is actually a charger. <laughs> <laughs> so get all the details, learn the terms. Did you get the charger? Uh-huh. Yeah, what charger? 
get the details. Um, straight on, short, kind of look boring to me. So I'm like, all right, let me just add something here. Put it off to the right. Rule of thirds, kind of mixed up a bit. This was one of the most amazing cakes I've ever seen. Amazing cakes. Yeah, this was up Sligoville recently. So this was a video of us light here and my little, my little um, light shining on that back there. It was dark, so you just add a little. So we're here to solve a problem. If you see something in camera that you need to fix, and you say, all right, it might look better, then you just think of a solution using light. Just add some light to the, to the head table. I want it looking natural. Luckily, we had fill light from the dance floor for this, for this wedding. Um, but usually, that direct flash look again, um, look, we were bouncing for this wedding because of the white roof. So bouncing behind me, just barely touching them, their faces with the light. And the off-camera light, lighting up this guy back here looking on. Without this flash, then back here would have been dark. So you add some dimension with the, with the multiple flash, flashes. So you can have one here and one on the other side to add dimension. And you change up the entire scene. Most, uh, all right, not really. So a room like this, rectangular room, if the head table is here, then the light will be over there, the light will be over there, um, shining straight across. So anywhere I go in the room, I have a backlight coming from multiple, like, it's just to the sides and shining across each other. So anywhere you go, and above everybody, so the person underneath this one is not blown out because it's kind of feathering out towards, so you just shine it above and then you illuminate. The same thing, flash, flash. If you have, if you're working with teams like DVC, where you have a lot of LEDs, it's even nicer. You don't have to set up so many flashes because the LED from the video guys um, will give you the same kind of illumination. And yeah, a lot of people start to use the dry ice smoke um, for receptions. And you have to shoot, you have to shoot enough for that chance to happen where this just, just happen to just, just go around the couple and just right there, you, you just, so you set yourself in the right position and get the shot. Yep. So any questions outside the realm or <laughs> Sherry Ann? So outside the realm, mm -hmm. um, what are your fees? Slow to the highest, to the range. That's one question. And then how do you handle instructions from other people? So, you know, guests are saying, come here, take a picture of me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, how you, mm -hmm. how you handle that? Because you don't want to upset anybody on the day or so on. But yeah. you have to be focused on your purpose. Mm -hmm. But everybody wants you to come and take a picture of them. So how do you treat that? So you can give me a price free. Price? <laughs> All right, price range is no 2,000 US to 5,000 US. Um, 2,000 US is for the three hour eloping package. Um, and after that, it's all day shooting or all day shooting with album. Only one package, two packages without a second shooter, the elope and the first, and then all day, shoot, all day shooting plus albums and assistant for the others. So price, pricing is, always evolving. Um, it's never static. It, if you're just starting out, it's a ticklish subject for everybody because you hear this thing about charge what you're worth, but if you think you're worth 10,000 10, US in Jamaica and the market is at 2,000 US, you're not going to get any job. It, if you're in California, it's a different thing. You can start at 10,000 US. So it's ticklish. Um, you have to assess where you are, um, what you can survive on, because if you're single, it will be different from if you're married with kids. So all of those things you have to factor in. Taxes, um, there's a lot of things to the mix. It's not just simply what you're worth. Uh, that's kind of unfair, because different markets charge different things. So, um, and the second question was, how you treat with people, easy, easy, easy. If you're doing wedding photography, you have to love people. Um, 
Usually people pull you to take pictures at the reception. And everybody's here is down. They were pulling you at the reception um, to take a picture of this, take a picture of that. Then it's just easy going, you take pictures. Your assistant take pictures. Um, you don't push them off. Um, they don't usually interrupt you at the critical stages like a ceremony or getting ready. Um, I think done it was first and then. Two things. Have mm -hmm. you ever done a double wedding? And what's the worst thing that could ever happen to you? As in two people getting, four people getting married on the same day? No, I've never, I've never done it. But you definitely would need at least three photographers, or four. I've never done one. Okay. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Worst. All right. No, I've never had a bad, bad experience. The worst thing I've seen is not. A, is not. No, I'm mean, never. I'm mean, never drop off a cliff. No. The worst thing I've seen happen after. Usually, I'm. It usually happens after the wedding, um, where couples break up two weeks after the wedding, and I still, I still have the album to do before. Yeah. So that's that's the worst I've seen. Yeah, and you and, and Bruce. <laughs> to, to, to give the pictures? Um, right. That varies with the season. So summer, if you're doing six weddings per month, you're looking at four to six weeks for a turnaround. If it's like September, October, when everybody broke, um, and you're doing one wedding or two weddings, then it's two to three weeks. Um, editing is the biggest part, but to set expectations. So you tell the couple that um, I'm going to be ready in eight weeks because of the volume of work, and then you try to beat that to give them in six. Um, so set the expectation by telling them a date further than what you, can, you think you can deliver, and, um, and send them teasers. I realize that once you send, send them teasers, it, they're, they're, they're good. Because they're, they're still in a panic state. I wonder if the pictures are right. Um, but once I see the teasers and they post them on social media, yeah. On average, how many images do you usually deliver to the, to the client? By myself, I shoot like two, five, 2,500 images and deliver seven, five to seven, 700 after trying to crunch it. Uh, wait, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. All right, everything, everything, when I, that is the longest part, selecting, narrowing down. Um, I usually do one mass sharpening, color grade um, for everything. And then the portrait sessions is where I spend most of the time. I don't calculate how long I spend on an image. For the, for the getting ready pictures, I'll select like five or five to ten, whitened teeth, whitened eyes of the bride, and so on, those detailed ones. The portrait session, I'll focus on those. For ceremony, um, not much time. For reception, not much time. But getting ready, some getting ready pictures and some portrait session. Um, and then you spend more time after that on your portfolio. So if you want to, some for portfolio, then you're going to spend more time on that. That's where you start to tuck in the side and <laughs> tuck in the belly. Yeah. Guests who are visiting the island, getting married here, mm -hmm. if you need three weeks to be delivered pictures and they're leaving by the next day, how do you send them out? Use FedEx or? All right, so we've done a few, a few um, cruise ship weddings. They don't leave the next day, they live same evening. So they come 11 o'clock and they're gone by 4.35. Um, deliver up the images by FedEx on a flash drive. Um, the link, they get a download link with the high-res files, so they already have the download, and then they get the, if they're in the United States, we're still recording, Clive. If they're in the United States, we send from the book company directly to them. Uh, rather than pay the shipping to come here and then ship to go back out. If they are here, then we ship here. It's a process called drop shipping, especially in the US. Yeah. Yes. So they drop off um, because the expected 
with bright expectations you know, are so high um, that they, 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 they uh, and that the fees are are, are, are falling and so they, they, they don't seem worth the continuing. But what do you um, that basically they, they, <coughs> they call it bright zilla. Mm -hmm. The brights are yeah, photographers drop out because of the bride, the demand of the bride. Um, and they're not willing to upgrade to like learning to edit. Because I've known a few photographers who drop out because they don't want to learn how to edit. Because they used to just carry their thing to the studio with the film and then drop out. Um, for bridezillas, guys, for photographers, we, we are loved by the brides. Who get the raw brunt of the stick is the planners. For the details, so you have to kind of help them. But most of the time, um, once you're courteous, once you're doing what you're supposed to do, they hired you based on what? Then you, on your portfolio. And they expect you to deliver um, what's in your portfolio. Um, speaking of which, we added some on the contract. We are not promising to provide the exact image like this. Right? Because some people expect you, oh, you didn't get the same image with this clothes doing this. Um, I couldn't, yeah, we really couldn't. So that's in the contract. I saw that online somewhere too, and I adopted it. Um, because people, I've heard it where they say, oh, it don't look like this. And different times. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Album? Yeah. All right, right now. Right now, we're using Album India. They're in India for, for high-end albums. And generally, um, we use Adorama. And there's another one in the States. No, not, no, not that one. There's another one. I don't remember the name. We just started trying out another one. No, no, not, you're not going to get the same quality. Well, I haven't been there in a while. But. Italy, yeah, Italy is another brand. There, there, are, there are a lot of album companies online um, out of the States that you have options. Um, two questions. One, how do you stay inspired? And the second question is, what advice or encouragement do you have for a bride who is disappointed with her wedding photos? Not necessarily your wedding photos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How I stay inspired is um, trying new things. Trying new things, like the ring. That's what I love about wedding photography. Every, every wedding is different, even though the program is almost the same. The, every wedding is different because everybody is different. Um, you'll get different expressions from brides, different angles. So that keeps me inspired, um, the fact that it's different. And the detailed shots and so on. Even if you shoot a venue 100 times, there's always another spot that you can do something different. So that's the beauty of photography. It's, it's, it, no one shot is the same, and you can always um, find something to do. Having said that, do it while you're young, because when you reach my age, over 40, these cameras start to get heavy, and you have to really motivate yourself. Um, so the bride that is not happy, um, you have, to, you have to dig deep within yourself and see if it's your fault. Um, did, I, did, I overextend my, did I extend myself enough to get the pictures that she wanted? And you have to be honest with yourself. Um, I've had a bride who said that the pictures look um, dull and, and the, 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 audience, the audience, everybody looks sad. I know, I know logically, I couldn't fix that because I would have to go and hi everybody. And yeah, yeah. but I didn't. I just said. I mean, it's. The, I guess it's the atmosphere. It was in the in the whole cathedral downtown, um, Holy Trinity. And for some reason, everybody was kind of somber. So it wasn't like a beach. So everybody did look. And I was looking for that happy smile and couldn't find it. That. But it was. It's not that they were sad. It's just the environment of the Catholic Church right there and that particular time. So she wasn't happy, um, but I really couldn't. I apologize. Even the ceremonies, but we don't, 
We don't say, yeah, you don't have to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, man, we do it. We do it. So there were a few like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't a lot. I have, mm. I have one suggestion. Yeah. When you're doing the ring pictures. The which one? The ring pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I'm actually a former jeweler. You're actually, what you need to do is to get the light mm. to the side or near to the back that then projects towards the diamond. To the back, to the, the back of the ring? The ring. Yes. Mm -hmm. And get it projected towards the diamond. Mm -hmm. Because diamonds refract to lights like this. And when you hit the light, light at the end, it does not. Yeah, yeah. Not reflect, because I'm operating based on you reflection. You to get the right refraction. Refraction, right. On the diamond. So yeah, yeah. And when you have it on the side or the back, then it actually hits the, the pavilion. Yeah. And then pushes out. Oh, oh. Thanks for that. Because uh, I'm operating from reflection mindset where bones and bones to the front. That makes sense. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, because uh, because what happens right. is that how it's caught is that the pivot then pulls the light and it pushes it to the front. And that's how it's designed. A follow up on the question that they asked in terms of to what extent did your experience do you also ensure that the movements are not mystical they didn't happen and that you can now kind of also you know direct that day of person on how often do you have to find yourself in your career by those moments that things are going to work are not predetermined or preset anybody here ever get a shot list from the bride? Yeah. Get shot list um we encourage shot lists, but we encourage the family breakdown, who combination of who you want. Um, you don't need to tell us, you don't need to tell us, take a picture of the dress. It's, that's obvious. So narrow it down to the key shots. A bride asks for a picture of her mom crying on a shot list. I, could, I couldn't go ask her mom to cry. <laughs> so, 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 so we were there, we were there all day looking for that mom to cry. She never cried. So, so there's nothing, there's, there are some things, yeah, walk with some, walk with pepper spray. Yeah, there's, there's not, there are some things that we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't fix. Um, in terms of pictures or like, no, but that same case, she wasn't expecting, she was expecting a happier, like, and she also mentioned, to be honest, um, overexposure. It was in the, it was in the cathedral downtown. Um, because it was dark, we kind of went for more of a bright, kind of add some light to it. It's not that the dress, you could see details in the dress, it wasn't overexposed, but I guess she was looking for more like a moody, moody type of thing. And another, and I remember another, another groom wanted vintage, wanted vintage. He didn't mention it before the wedding. Um, and I went through the editing process, the, 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 the dress and the, and the suit didn't, I guess it lent itself for vintage because she had the, 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 the veil that come around like right here. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't pick up on it, and I didn't vintage. I didn't get the presets for the vintage look. And him asked me, but luckily that can be fixed afterwards. Um, but yeah, that overexposure was one that it was too bright for her. Um, but I promised her to pull it back down and re-edit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, if, if, yeah, you do have people who want privacy. Even though the pictures are ours, um, we own the copyright, I don't think I should turn away a client because they want privacy. Um, it's not that important for me to, to, to use their pictures if they request privacy. So I explained to them, and it's in the contract, by default, we can advertise. We can do what we want with the pictures, except sales. Um, 
But if you want privacy, you let me know and we'll do it. I can't tell you yet because I can't tell you yet because that they haven't released the images yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. I think the deserves a big hand. This was quite an educational evening for us here. Yeah. Um, some of you know that I, I have dabbled a little in, in wedding photography. Um, he, he didn't want to tell you his embarrassing moment, but I must tell you what happened to me. I have a witness with Marie. Um, during a wedding, I was doing the ring shots. I got three rings to shoot. And I lost one of the rings for a whole hour. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I said, Marie, Marie, I'm in trouble. I can't find the ring. She said, You must be drinking my push. <laughs> well, anyway, it was a very serious thing. And eventually, I found it in a pocket. What? I thought they, they, they laid the sweep off to sweep the place, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's not about the rule. Um, Mary, really, when, when I grow up, I would like to be like you. <laughs> um, you're really a warm person, a giving person. Um, must be the influence from your wife, who we must thank for buying you that. Ready. That ready. That ready camera on that day. I mean, you have really been open with all your... The, Trade secrets, I can assure you, it won't leave this room. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, many of us, some of us doing more uh, wedding photography than others. Some of us want to be general uh, photographers. And the tips you have given us this evening will certainly carry us up far away. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of us will have a little cousin getting married, they don't have the budget for a big photographer like you. And we say, can you help me? And we, and we, we you know, it, you have given us some tips. I think we can all go out there. We won't be taking away much of your business. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that. But um, you also, what came across to me is that you love people. Yes. And I know that as a wedding photographer, you have to. I mean, that makes it much, so much more fun yes. when you really love, love mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And um, you're a perfectionist. You know, and you're not afraid to say, listen, I messed up in this particular thing, you know. Um, some artists are haughty and, you know, I'm the best. And you're always learning and, and challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're really give, giving us a number of gems here. And we hope that you've gone 10 years in the business and you'll do another 20. You're still young. <laughs> and, and the back will hold up. <laughs> and, um, we do a lot more. We thank you very much thank you, for Bruce. what you've passed on. Um, thank you. On behalf of the Jamaica Photographer Society, a certificate of appreciation. Presented to our guest presenter, Mary Coosley. Thank you.